Hello everyone, I'm Nina Gopal. Welcome to Global Express. This is our interaction with experts on stories and developments in our backyard and beyond. Do click on the new Indian Express website and tweet and follow Global Express. Now, March 3rd marked the day when a man who's always played second fiddle to his older brother, the Sharif patriarch Nawaz Sharif, seems to have stepped out from his shadow. Shabazz Sharif is the new Prime Minister of Pakistan. This is his second term. The last time he took office was through a very controversial vote in the House that brought Imran Khan's government down. Since then, Pakistan has been in a state of turmoil. It's not just the street protests that erupted over Imran Khan's arrest and subsequent jailing. It's also the multiple challenges before the new leadership. Shehbaz takes power at a time when Pakistan's economy is in a shambles. It's teetering on the brink of an economic collapse. More importantly, he takes office when politically too, the mandate seems to have gone not just to Imran per se, but against the army. It seems as if all the old faces are back, the very people that had been rejected by a very angry electorate. The Parvez Hoot Boy, the writer has called it a horse race followed by a horse trade. Mani Shankaraya has called it the elect called the election historic because he says the people defeated the army. Can Shahbaz Sharif pull this off? This dispensation has the backing of the army chief, General Asim Munir. The up army and the PPP and the PMLN coalition seem to be on the same page. Will it last? Talking to us today are India's former ambassador to Pakistan, Ajay Basaria, whose new book, Anger Management, The Troubled Relationship Between India and Pakistan, is truly a sensational. Top of the bestseller list. Welcome, Ambassador. And Thank you. Mubashar Lakman, talking to us from Pakistan. He was an advisor to the government, an investigative journalist who's launched four television channels and whose blogs and podcasts have a huge following in Pakistan. Welcome, Mr. Mubashar Lakman. So my Thank you very much, question, Mr. Kupal. My first question goes to you, Ms. Lokman. Will the people of Pakistan, whose mandate seems to have been anti-army and seemingly pro-Imran Khan, accept this arrangement that has, been that has been reached between the various political parties, where the Prime Minister, the Chief Minister, and now even the President uh, all seem to be prearranged? And the elephant in the room, of course, is Mr. Imran Khan. Can he mount a challenge from within the jail? I mean, he wasn't able to rip up the numbers in the National Assembly vote. His Sunni Ittihad Council candidate, Omar Ayub Khan, only got 92 votes. So, Shehbaz Sharif pulled 201 votes when he needed to win only 169. So tell me, people's latent anger, will it erupt into new street protests uh, as uh, the PTI is threatening to take over the streets uh, on Saturday? What, what, do we, what can we expect? Thank you, Nina, for having me and uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Ajay as well. Good to see him. And I'd really like to get hold of his book. I mean, um, I, I can't find it over here, so you please better send that to me. Coming back to we your question, to coming coming back to your question, I, I don't think uh, um, Imran Khan can do much more right now than what he has done already. His people have shown resilience. They've gone and they've voted for him. And as expected, and as I told in your show last time, that it will not be Nawaz Sharif, but Shabazz Sharif, who will become the prime minister. And he did. In fact, uh, uh, let me share an um, uh, inside story with you that hasn't been really reported in Pakistan. Uh, when PMLN and Pakistan People's Party were negotiating heads on with each other, and uh, they come, they had come up a moment when they could not agree on anything, and then suddenly PMLN said that, okay, Bilawal, you become the prime minister, and we will not get any ministries, and we'll just take whatever you are asking from us. So let's reverse rules. And it was agreed. It was agreed. And uh, People's Party team went back very happy, thinking that they have finally got the Prime Minister post. And the next day, um, something happened and it turned around. And somebody said, no, I want Shabazz Sharif. And Shabazz Sharif was again uh, made the Prime Minister. I don't know. But I mean, as for the uh, grape wine, it was the establishment that wasn't very keen on getting anybody else other than because this is going to be a coalition government. And apart from other things, uh, Shabazz Sharif in his last stint as the prime minister, though a very weak prime minister, he displayed one thing that he can take a coalition forward and a take a coalition ahead in time. And if this government has to do well in any capacity, 
then this correlation has to be kept intact. Uh, already they have all the reasons in the world to fall out uh, from each other. And uh, so it will be a Herculean effort. As far as uh, Pakistan Tariq and Saab is concerned, I think they should be happy. They've got a government in KPK and they can show their progress over there and uh, show to the rest of the world that, you know, uh, their majority really made a difference to KPK. And this is the third time in running that they are forming a government over there. So they can't even complain and put the blame on the previous governments for no progress or no work. So I I don't really see any any kind of prolonged street protests. If there are, if there are, then it has to do with inflation, food inflation, and uh, you know um, bills that people can't pay, especially energy bills. The energy cost has really gone. Um, so we'll, get, uh, we'll get to the economy. We'll get to the economy and the travails of the people in a minute. If I can just come back, come to you, Ambassador Basaria. You've written this book where you've given the inside details of what it was like to deal with uh, various people in the Pakistan, uh, you know, government. This time, also, you've called this the PDM three three point oh. You've said it's another experiment, really. Uh, and but there's a very key member of the uh, old. Uh, you know, regime, Fazlur Rahman, who's not, not part of the game this time. And he's going to sit, he says, on the opposition benches. And it looks like, uh, you know, uh, you know, the PPP, as uh, Mr. Lukman says, has got, uh, you know, uh, may not be in government per se, but it could walk away with all the big prizes. I mean, the presidency, the Senate chairman, they've got two states, Sindh and Balochistan. Uh, you know, there's also a talk of a backroom deal, uh, I think it was Mr. Lukman who said this a uh, couple of days ago in one of his shows, that uh, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari want, will probably uh, be made a prime minister in, in a year and a half or so. So do you see this as a recipe for stability when there are so many people working at cross purposes? Well, the only way, uh, reason why this will be somewhat stable is that uh, from India's vantage, you know, the old Pakistan has won over the new Pakistan. It's really back to the future. And, uh, it, you know, it, it is in a sense a continuation of the uh, hybrid uh, democracy that we have come to see. Um, mm. And I, in many ways, the army has uh, consolidated its hold. What did happen on the 8th of February was that people got a tantalizing glimpse of the people's actual views, uh, you know, which yeah. was two thirds favoring Imran Khan. Now you might argue that it was a sympathy wave for Imran Khan, coalescing into an anti-army mood, uh, uh, along with an anti, uh, 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 you know, a disaffection with the economy. But whatever mm. it is, the people uh, seem to be thinking in one direction and between form 45 and form 47, uh, there seemed to be a complete reversal uh, engineered by the army with its pre-election engineering, its election day rigging, and its uh, post-election management. So I think from India's vantage, what we are seeing is uh, really uh, the old Pakistan winning over uh, the new Pakistan. Uh, as uh, you referred to and as Lukman suggested, you know, it is um, the army has... Uh, now is doubling down, uh, not backing down in, in in terms of dealing with the dissent uh, that the Imran camp produced. They have what they wanted. They have a minus Imran and a minus Nawaz formula. So the minus Nawaz formula is what I'm most fascinated by. Absolutely. So I think it is not without thought uh, that uh, we have both uh, minus Imran and minus Nawaz because. Uh, we all know the history that thrice in the past, Nawaz had a midterm itch during his tenure and felt that he should actually be ru running the country, uh, whereas uh, he was uh, not really permitted to do that. So I think uh, there was a minus Nawaz formula uh, which was being uh, talked about and uh, that has been implemented. Now, whether that is because Nawaz didn't get the numbers or whether he was simply asked to stay away, uh, we can't be sure. But uh, I would agree that uh, this would be relatively stable or the army would have reason to keep this coalition going at least for 18 months 
until Asim Munir comes up for his next term. Uh, this, the extension before which typically in Pakistan we see a lot of activity and whether that means changing horses or engineering some instability in order to get the army chief is uh, his extension uh, that's much in the future but i think right now the problem is that pakistan deals with the poly crisis with an economic crisis right on top and uh, it it deals uh, with uh, a situation where uh, you have uh, shabash sharif running an uncertain coalition but my uh, feeling is he will continue to get uh, strong support from the army uh, to uh, have this run at least for 18 months. Uh, Mr. Lukman, if you could come in on this minus Nawaz formula, don't you, isn't there also a very uh, common feeling, I mean, a uh, talk that uh, Nawaz Sharif has chosen to sit it out this time because he wants to see to it that his name is cleared and, the, and his son's names are cleared from the Panama, uh, you know, starring, and that he wants to ensure that, uh, you know, that Shabash Sharif, who has a good equation with the army, is the one who runs the show while he gets, uh, you know, uh, and his very uh, glamorous uh, daughter, who's supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite the, uh, you know, powerhouse, uh, runs Punjab under his uh, sort of guidance. I, I, um, I, I tend to disagree with the ambassador on one ground. Uh, I agree with most of his analysis, though. Uh, and one ground being that Nawasri was uh, sidestepped or sidelined. I think uh, he did not, uh, he wasn't sidelined because if he had crossed a red line, so had Maryam, his daughter then, mm -hmm. and she became the chief minister of Punjab. So, I mean, those lines were erased and, you know, they were accepted and all the cases had been withdrawn and everything. And today, sometime in the evening, his two sons are coming back to Pakistan for the first time and they've already applied in the court. Uh, for mercy, please, and all that. But the problem with Nawaz, I mean, was a two-prone problem. One, he wanted a bigger majority. He does not want to head a coalition. He doesn't want to end up going down on his knee and trying to please every member of the coalition. That's not for him. He thinks he's God's mm. gift to mankind, and that's it. You know, that's the way he looks at it. Yeah, but the yeah. other thing I've is that, that... And the other thing is that, on a serious note, Though PMLN insiders are absolutely tight-lipped about it, Nawaz mm -hmm. is suffering from health issues. Uh, I'm told that people who know him and who are close to him that he's suffering, uh, suffering uh, from uh, mild dementia. That he has to be reminded, you know, every time uh, he meets a person about that person and the background and everything. So while I mean his previous memory or memory ten years back is perfectly fine. And he sort of goes on and on about the motorways and the deals and the being the economic power and all that. His current memory does have his issues. So PMLN also was reluctant to bring him over there and expose that. And and this is going to be a pressure time for the government. It's not going to be a typical government government, uh, you know, uh, um, entertainment ride. It's going to be seriously a roller coaster ride. And they need a government that can take all the shocks and then steer away. And I agree with the ambassador. I think the 18 months are going to be absolutely um, worryless. They can, don't have to worry about anything for those next 18 months. It is beyond uh, that October or November of next year. When an, another person comes in as the army chief, then um, Shabazz has to really think. With, um, you yeah, know, and, uh, um, and to actually be very, very, uh, you know, I mean, absolutely clear on this, they have not chosen well in the past when they picked their army chiefs. They've, I mean, you had the classic example of Musharraf, of uh, General Musharraf, you know, that that went very badly wrong. Uh, actually, many... uh, ironically, even this time, uh, their choice was not really, um, you know. <laughs> As per the wishes of the people, let's put it honestly and fairly. Uh, really? According to, uh, because according to Imran Khan, Asim Munir had retired two days prior to his appointment. So that's true. But according uh, according to the SOPs, uh, uh, if a person is appointed, you know, uh, before his appointment, so he can take charge later on as well and say that retirement goes out of the window. But having said that, I think the problem will always arise. 
when uh, you try to pick and choose your man, your man or my man, and you know place him over there, um, I if the senior most people are coming and taking their turns, like in the Supreme Court, we have the senior most judge coming in. Uh, we've had a chief justice for only forty days because that yeah. was the time left in his retirement. So I think that's a very good arrangement if people can come to that kind of an understanding and, you know, then um, all conspiracy theories uh, will be out of the window. And um, But then it's too too early to comment on November 2025 right now. Mm. I cannot talk about today. That's right. No, could we, could we look at another issue, basically? I mean, you've talked about the fact that uh, KPK, Khyber Pakhtunpa, is, uh, has gone to the Imran Khan party for the third time running, third uh, se se session running. But the point is that he didn't actually cover himself in glory at that point because uh, there were very huge question marks about his pro-Taliban sort of line where he's supposed to have... Uh, asked the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan and groups that are affiliated to them, which were, you know, uh, uh, had their, uh, you know, refuge in Afghanistan to come back and resettle in Waziristan. And uh, that was looked at, you know, with a huge question mark, uh, uh, not just by the army, because the Tehrike Taliban was attacking the army. It had massacred school children. Uh, and so on and so forth. So isn't the army worried? Wasn't there a core commander's meeting which basically said a, a couple of days ago that uh, they would not allow uh, this kind of thing to uh, happen again under a PTI government in KPK? No, I think this time again, it may not be possible for uh, Ali Amin Gandapur, who's the chief minister now, over there. But let me tell you uh, last night's uh, story. I don't know whether you caught that in India or not. Three Afghan terrorists were caught outside the uh, Adiala jail uh, where yes. Imran Khan is held and they were caught with a uh, serious uh, amount of explosives and maps to his cell. So, But the good thing is, for once there's a good thing to report about it that none of them is killed and they were all captured alive. And now they can be interrogated mm -hmm. and, you know, we can sort of go back in line and see who the handlers are, who the facilitators are. But there are two major question marks over this. A, were they here to create a form of terrorism, which they could have if they were sort of that close? Or were they here to plan a release for Imran Khan? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answer to that as yet. But, but the most important thing is that they crossed Afghanistan and the whole of KPK and then through Atak, and they came over here in Pinti, uh, yeah. which has the Ala jail. So, I mean, what was KPK police and law enforcement doing over there? And, you know, so these kind of issues will arise more and more with this kind of defiant stance uh, by uh, the new CM over there. And I think uh, in Pakistan, um, as far as this is concerned, there is a unanimous opinion of all the co-commanders and everyone involved over there that there is no respite. There is no respite for terrorists, terrorism, terrorist facility, uh, facilitators, and those who are the main ninth instigators. So there's mm. a can, clearly drawn line. You, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see that. I mean, I don't think they're going to allow, given the free hand that he wants in KPK, uh, and I'm sure that the police and the army will be, uh, you know, will be under a tighter reign. Ambassador Bissaria, how much truth do you think is there to allegations that Imran Khan made that uh, the U.S. interfered directly in his re removal from office and in sort of, you know, engineering this uh, hybrid regime uh, and seeing to it that, you know, that, uh, I mean, the, there are reports of Mr. General Asim Munir holding talks, meeting people in Washington, and of course, backroom talks even in London with Nawaz Sharif. Do you, I mean, you you love, love all these inside stories. So, did you hear anything which uh, which point in that direction? Uh, I think uh, it's fairly well established now by most Pakistan watchers that that was a narrative uh, manufactured by uh, the PTI and by Imran Khan, knowing that it was not entirely true. You know, we have to grant them that perhaps the U.S. at that point saw its, um, that it was in its interest not to have Imran Khan 
uh, re-elected or, or uh, continuing given the postures he had taken. But I don't think there was any active interference uh, on this issue. Uh, I think yeah. it just some commentary that had come. It just was a convenient political uh, ploy for, uh, for Imran Khan and his team to use at that point of time to make a case. Uh, but uh, surely no one seriously believes that the uh, U.S. was doing uh, some good old-fashioned uh, engineering and regime change uh, in Pakistan because I don't think it, was, it would have uh, served its purpose in any way. Mm, yeah, and also I think to them, I think Pakistan is not uh, the top of the list of priorities. I think right now for them, they're distracted as they are by Ukraine and the Middle East, uh, you know. I think that's where their focus is. And of course, China, uh, you know, as long as China remains. Now, if I can just get to the nuts and bolts of the actual problems facing Pakistan, which is the economy, uh, you know, what do you see as Pakistan's biggest challenge? Because, you know, without another IMF loan, Pakistan's going to see enormous hardship visited on the poor. And uh, what does Pakistan need to do for, to set its economic house in order? Because under Imran Khan, China has stepped back a bit because of all the attacks that were unleashed on its uh, workers in, uh, in, uh, in and around Gwadar and so on. Uh, could you uh, talk to us about that, uh, Mr. Lokman? Yeah, I, I can tell you two or three things categorically. Uh, one... Um... America would have been very pleased by Imran Khan because he had practically rolled back the CPAC and he had halted all the economic zones and all the projects between China and Pakistan. Uh, in fact, a CPAC uh, um, authority was made uh, when only a chairman was appointed and none of, not even the four members of the authority were appointed, let alone having it work. In 16 economic zones, uh, in, and I speak with authority when I say that, not more than 10% of work was done in any of them. So, I mean, so much so for him being anti-America or, you know, pro-China. But the fact of the matter is that the IMF loan is coming through and there is no hitch over that. And that is a, a mere negotiation, a formality that will happen. You see, Pakistan's problem is not loans, Nina. Pakistan has two different other problems. No country in the world is without debt. America has more debt than anyone else. Japan as bigger debt than you and I can begin to fathom and, and calculate on our uh, calculators. It is uh, when the country is unable to generate revenue streams and additional revenue streams or new revenue streams, and it can find a way of employing majority of the people, which is especially the youth primarily. And then uh, the overhead costs, the administrative costs of a country. Now, with this new government, they are expected to take some very unpopular decisions which are in the right direction, like uh, disposing of um, state giants that are guzzlers, basically, and just four or five of them in between PIA and Steel Mill and a couple of others, they drain, down, drain us down by 2,000 billion every year. So even if we give them away for free, you know, that is the amount of money that we will be saving for the national budget and, you know, for development and all those things. And the other thing so is the administrative... Is, PIA up to sale? is that what you're saying? PIA yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think it's a done deal now. It's a matter of time before it's sold. And so is the steel mill. But you see, we are, have 18th Amendment. I don't know whether you are familiar with the 18th Amendment or not. That make makes the provinces autonomous and, you know, they get the money yes. from the uh, federal government. But they do not contribute any money back to the federal government. But after that, 17 ministries have been redundant. That shouldn't be there in the federal government. And likewise, 400 departments. And so they are all guzzlers. So Pakistan has to take serious administrative actions. And in the words of Margaret Thatcher, they have to become butchers now. And they have to mm -hmm. chop off you know, that dead word and create new revenue streams. And I've been a great, uh, I've been a great believer in one thing, that one of the easiest ways for Pakistan to create a revenue stream is by handshake with India. I mean, yes, India has yes. led the way in the world for IT and agriculture and many other things, and we can only benefit from them. And India can benefit from our territorial depth and everything uh, linking with Afghanistan. So it's a win-win situation if both of them can come to some normal arrangements, you know. 
Do you, do you agree with that, Ambassador Basaria? Because, uh, you know, during your time, there were uh, talks of, you know, sort of, uh, I mean, uh, Prime Minister Modi flew to uh, Lahore, uh, you know, to, to attend, uh, uh, you know, then Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's granddaughter's wedding. And there was talk at that time of a backroom deal where they would put Kashmir on hold for 20 years and, uh, you know, look at a free trade agreement, all of which went belly up uh, after Imran Khan came in. What, what do you think? And, and, I, and, uh, and this incredible uh, ex-Twitter uh, comment, uh, congratulatory message that uh, Modi has sent Shahbaz Sharif. I mean, it's not as fulsome as the one that, uh, that he did when uh, last year, but it's still there. So do you see a warmer ties? Do you see something else happening? No. You know, uh, Nina, first on the uh, economy piece, you know, I, I would, uh, from India's uh, view again, uh, that is really the key element of the poly crisis that Pakistan faces. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. economic crisis, the twin deficits, uh, the, you know, the fiscal and, and the uh, ex uh, balance of payments deficit. But um, uh, it's clear that Pakistan will go into its uh, 24th uh, program. But the problem remains that um, the it is not enough. You know, it's it's an immediate um, crisis management measure. But what Pakistan really needs is what India had to do in the 90s, which is deep structural reform, which goes on for uh, a decade or more. And uh, that is what it would take uh, for Pakistan to become a normal country. Now, there are signs that there is a recognition of this, the armies and Bajwa doctrines talk of geoeconomics. Uh, also, I think the recognition that this PDM government uh, will uh, rapidly lose whatever little political capital it has because of the tough decisions it will have to take on gas prices yeah. and so on. Uh, but it will eventually, uh, and it will have the backing of the army to do that because any uh, government that does that will be unpopular. But, you know, what we should remember is that it's not a quick fix, but it's it uh, requires a decade of reform for Pakistan to get there. And that means one of the reforms, structural changes, is that the army should get out of the economy. Where, where, uh, military Inc., as we know, controls a large chunk of the economy. and that. But General Asan Munir is apparently a member of the structural something, SIFC. you know, SIFC. Yes, yes absolutely. So, so that, there, are no signs, direct... there, there are no signs that that reform of the army stepping back from its role in the economy is happening. But uh, in any case, the other bits of reform have to go on. On, on the bilateral piece, uh, yes, you saw the prime minister's tweet. It was a perfunctory tweet. And I think it was three or four uh, clear messages one was that um, the congratulations to Shabazz Sharif meant that India had no views on the flawed electoral process. Uh, India uh -huh. was, uh, you know, leaving it to Pakistan's people and Pakistan's government to sort it out. There were no views on uh, on questioning uh, the electoral process as such. The second was that India will exhibit a good deal of strategic patience. Uh, India is in no hurry to engage with this uh, uh, government because India has its own elections coming up. Uh, and uh, the message is that um, Shabazz Sharif and the army have a long rope. If they feel they ought to make good with India, then uh, it is a time for them to work it out uh, between themselves and to reach out to India. There are multiple channels available to do that. And for a possible rapprochement and a possible conversation uh, in the second half of the year. So I think uh, the uh, uh, expectation would be that uh, once there's coherence in Pakistan and, uh, you know, they would uh, perhaps reach out. But at this point of time, uh, for neither country, the other is a priority. Not for India, which is looking at an internal electoral process, and not for Pakistan, which has uh, many other troubles to deal with in the economy, the Western Front, uh, and so on. So I think uh, that is not a priority. Um, Mr. Lukman, you did talk to us uh, earlier about uh, you know these uh, the trade corridor. You said that you know if in, if India and Pakistan actually come to an agreement on trade, then you can import uh, you know. Uh, uh, food and other things cheaper uh, if it comes from India rather than if it comes all the way from Canada. 
and uh, you, could you could you elaborate on on that you see uh, uh, india and pakistan are right next door neighbors and uh, india too is an agricultural country and we are importing pulses and all those kind of things from canada from australia and look at the air freight and look at the insurance costs that we pay i mean all we have to do is open the vaga border and you know uh, get truck loads from there and that would immediately bring down the food inflation no so much so for pakistan but i look at this tweet that you uh, mentioned to ambassador in a, a fifth uh, um, sided look as well i mean you mentioned four sides to it and i think in the longer run in the second part of the year that timeline i agree with him uh, it is going to be a very vital read because india is actually now moving ahead to uh, reaffirm its position as one of the global superpowers and for the kind of lead roles that it wants to play in in the global world economy and um, other areas so i think it will be uh, when india goes for its uh, final try of being a permanent member of united nations security council it will be imperative that india as every neighbor and neighboring country looking up to india uh and you know sort of there be there not really in support but at least not be in a uh, disapproval as well i mean you don't need our support but you definitely need us to be quiet uh, in certain areas and then if uh, india and afghanistan can have a trade using pakistan as a territory in between then it will benefit india as well it will benefit afghanistan as well whether we like it or not nina whether we like it or not whether we admit it or not whether that will happen or not but india pakistan bangladesh afghanistan iran uh, these countries need to uh, develop each other and uh, uh, you know discover more trade and commerce between each other if they really want to stay above the water and stay stay afloat i mean um, i i think uh, that is a future uh, yani if you can trade but with your region and within your region that is always going to be more beneficial what about the elephant in the room kashmir which which uh, which shahbaz sharif did refer to in his acceptance speech when he was sworn in and which has been everyone sort of... will have to revert to it but remember there's a huge change with this tweet for the first time i i am following the indian elections and there is no anti pakistan bashing over there there is mm. no anti pakistan rhetoric and that's in a very long time that's the first time that i i'm not seeing it over there so india has also matured and they don't look at us as the kind of uh, problem that will win them seats and votes and all that and pakistan also has to understand that you know things have to be talked out and they don't just have to be talked out uh, in one particular perspective or you know it has to um, mr ajit deol and uh, general fazmi they had come up with a solution earlier i mean two years back when they had compartmentalized different issues kashmir being one of them and the great part was that both india and pakistan had agreed to begin talks on multiple areas and multiple options kashmir included so if for instance kashmir talks were not getting anywhere that did not mean that we stopped playing cricket with each other or stopped the exporting bollywood films or importing vegetables from india so they delinked everything and so one thing did not lead to a confusion about the other thing and that is the kind of a formula that we need whenever we begin or whenever we are ready it's not now or never it's whenever we are ready uh, that is the kind that's of a, that's a good point we need. Yeah. That's a very good point. Ambassador Basaria, do you agree with uh, Mr. Lukman? Yes, uh, you know what Mr. Lukman is saying uh, is uh, exactly right. So, you know, I would say you've talked of three things. One is uh, of course trade, and I would agree that trade and connectivity are the low-hanging fruit uh, that we can uh, grab as we move forward in a rapprochement process. and you know we know that there are strong equities in pakistan uh, in uh, doing trade with india the, the, there's a strong dependency of the textile and pharmaceutical sector uh, in particular but even otherwise i think uh, there is uh, to be great benefit uh, but prior to that we need to build that trust and and uh, uh, from india's point of view uh, have a significant uh, reduction in uh, in terrorism uh fortunately we haven't had spectacular acts of terrorism uh 
uh, for five years. But if you talk to Indian security agencies, they will talk about the new kind of drone drops happening in Punjab and Kashmir. But uh, I think uh, that um, is an easily resolvable issue. And uh, when we move ahead, trade and connectivity is a low-hanging fruit. On Jammu and Kashmir, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi went uh, to the region today. And there, I think, you know, his message was a healing touch, a development touch. And uh, the way the paradigm has shifted from for India is that India's Kashmir policy is now completely distinct from its Pakistan policy. Uh, Pakistan is a foreign policy. Kashmir is a domestic issue. And the two are not going to be conflated uh, anymore. So I think uh, that uh, is also a bit of a paradigm shift. And on the, on the bit about Indian elections and Pakistan not being an issue, I think that has been the story for a while. The issue that uh, uh, tends to crop up in a major way is terrorism. So if you had a spectacular act of terrorism, unfortunately, the issue will be back uh, in focus um, because I think even in the last election, it was uh, Pulwama and uh, stand against those issues rather than Pakistan per se. But in, in any case, I think it's good that uh, in neither country's uh, electoral discourse, the other country uh, figures in a major way and there is no grandstanding. So that's, I think, positive. And uh, I, I, I have a feeling that, uh, uh, you know, uh, even though we will not agree on Kashmir, what we heard in the last couple of uh, years, uh, particularly the leaks that came out of Pakistan and the back channel conversations, there was a positive uh, conversation around freezing the issue uh, for a while, for a couple of decades. So I, I think uh, there, there are multiple ways to go forward on it uh, quietly through quiet channels and uh, after both elections are over. That's a very good point, actually. If we can uh, just conclude, if we can uh, make concluding remarks, I, I'm very curious about the personality of General Asim Munir. Uh, Mr. Lokmal, what kind of person is he? He's obviously not a confrontational person because he's not, he doesn't get into a tit for tat kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, I, this is us as an outsider looking in, uh, you know, and, uh, but he has, uh, has been settling scores with uh, Imran Khan quite, uh, you know, convincingly. And there's also talk that uh, there is a section in the army that is, supports him completely. And that, uh, but there is also a, a, a lot of support for Imran Khan because he's such a popular cricketing icon. Nina, one, um, I, I really can't make much of a comment about General Asim Munir because I've only met him once. I've only met him once and that was uh, when he was a major general, uh, when he wasn't a, a full general. And whatever little I remember of him is that he was a man of very few words. He did not talk and he answered in three or four worded answers. You know, I mean, that was it. And uh, most of his answers were decisions, either acknowledging or the other way around. So he's not a man of a lot of words and you can't be with him and then make out what's going through his mind. I'm, a, I'm sure. Uh, I, I don't envy him. Um, but there'll be a lot going through his mind right now. But the fact of the matter is when you are an army chief in a nuclear country, of a nuclear country, in a country like Pakistan, you don't need to display, you know, any bravado or anything. You know what you have and you know the power that you have. So he's very calm over there. But um, uh, far as uh, uh, popularity of Imran Khan is concerned, Imran Khan is a popular person. There is no doubt. Nobody can de dispute mm. that. And he's become more popular ever since he was sacked. And then right. his popularity took another uh, upward trend, a spike, when uh, um, Shabazz Sharif came in, uh, Bilawal came in, because people thought that we do not like Imran Khan, but we hate these guys. So there was yeah. a double edge uh, advantage. And then the third time, when three cases were you know, uh, given verdicts are given in three cases in one week against him, then there was a sympathy mode uh, just before the election. So, yes, he is riding a wave of popularity. But, you know, institutions, uh, institutions work on principles and, and, you know, their own SOPs. Like the ambassador will vouch over here. 
he can personally say that Pakistan and India should have a cricket match, but he'll have to go by whatever his institutional policy is. Personal choices do not matter uh, in institutions. Nina. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. I think so. You're basically saying that we can see stability and a little bit of, you know, the, the, since the, the relationship between him and Shahbaz Sharif are basically not techy. Uh, as it is between him and Imran Khan, we probably have a smooth. Nina, do we have a minute? Can I? Can I? Can I add on? Yes. Anything? Yes, please. Uh, I, I'm. And the ambassador will have better history. I mean, but I can tell you roughly that between France and England, they've been on 188 wars. Between other European countries, they've been thousands of wars, and now they have no borders. And and they've realized after so many uh, senseless killings and uh, endless wars that eventually they need to be together and learn to trade and all that. India and Pakistan, True. if they, if there are hardliners on both sides, if there are hawks on both sides, they can, they're welcome to go and have 10 more wars, but eventually they will have to sit together and find out a peaceful solution. And I think the sooner we get to that, the better it is for both of us. And it's a very good point. Excellent point. Ambassador Sharia, concluding remarks? Yes, you know, so let me take forward what Mr. Lukman said. On, on Asim Munir, you know, I think uh, it's an important question to uh, ask what you've asked, Nina, because he is the most powerful man in uh, Pakistan and India exactly. deals with Pakistan as it is and rather than as it should be. And I think the jury is out on Asim Munir. He hasn't laid all his cards on the table from India's point of view. Uh, he clearly is a strongman from a, uh, from an internal point of view who will uh, uh, is appearing the uh, you know exhibiting the body language of a person who will put down uh, the the challenge and the rebellion from a section uh, supported by Im Imran Khan. So that I think uh, will be uh, a, a quite uh, uh, no nonsense and brutal, perhaps even. Uh, put down of that uh, rebellion and I have no doubt uh, that that is the direction in which the internal politics will move. But on the India piece, uh, we aren't sure whether uh, he would continue with what was the alleged Bajwa doctrine of having good relations with neighbors. Uh, uh, my suspicion is that he will because uh, this is exactly in Pakistan's self-interest. And uh, in, in the longer Term, let me echo the uh, optimism Mr. Lukman expressed, because I think essentially uh, India is looking at uh, having a normal relationship with a normal Pakistan. And what India feels is that uh, it is in Pakistan's self-interest to normalize itself, to normalize its economy, uh, which means uh, also having the, uh, the uh, army step out of uh, the uh, of managing the economy so closely and of having uh, a normal policies which do not include uh, deploying militant organizations uh, against neighbors and so on. So I think uh, I, I would be optimistic in the medium term that Pakistan uh, would normalize and and uh, have the instincts of having a normal relationship with India. And I have a feeling that uh, this would be the legacy um, uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, as well as uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, or uh, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif and the Sharif brothers uh, would like to leave at the end of this tenure. And that's very well put because I've also heard that Shabazz Sharif is very keen to visit Indian Punjab. So is Mariam Nawaz. So who knows what could happen? Thank you very much for taking part in the program. Pakistan is clearly facing its toughest test yet, but I think with a stable government in place, maybe we could see good things happen on both sides. Uh, do click on the Global Express, the new Indian Express website to watch the program. Thank you.